is a sauna really worth the hype? I feel like we live in an era now where everything is sensationalized. It's so difficult to ascertain if something's legit or not. I did a similar video to this on cold plunging because is cold plunging worth the hype? Like people tout all these crazy benefits, but when we dove deep into it, there's not much literature to back it up. All of it seems to be anecdotal or just mental, which counts for a lot, don't get me wrong. Like mental fortitude and building that resilience there, infinite potential with that. But is sauna the same thing? Like if I talk about a sauna or I see someone else talk about a sauna, people just really jump on them saying you're a tinfoil hat wearing weirdo because you think saunas are cool. Well, when I looked at the literature, it was pretty crazy. I'm a big sauna guy and I wanted to make sure I wasn't drinking my own Kool-Aid because my anecdotal experience is amazing. Anyhow, the first one is simple cardiovascular health, right? With that, when you jump in a sauna, you feel like you're working out, like realistically your heart is pumping, you're breathing heavily, you're vasodilated, it feels like you're working out, like it feels like you're running. When you jump in a cold plunge, it's hard, but you don't feel like you're working out, you just feel like you're suffering. Like I feel like I'm working out in a, cold, in a, in a sauna. Now with this, there's data. There was a study published uh, in JAMA, like a huge study, took a look at over 2,300 Finnish participants and it tracked them for over 20 years, 20.7 years, okay? And it looked at their sudden cardiac disease risk, like their sudden cardiac death. They also looked at uh, just regular coronary heart disease, cor uh, regular cardiovascular disease risk, and all-cause mortality. What they found is that compared to one time per week sauna, going in a sauna for two to three times per week led to a 22% decrease in sudden cardiac death and about the same decrease in the other categories too. But in those that went in a sauna four to seven days per week, there was a 63% less risk of sudden cardiac death. And again, very similar percentages in the other groups as well. Okay, that is very, very strong data. So no matter who you are from a general health cardiovascular perspective, it makes sense. But we have to understand mechanisms to really get excited about it. So what's happening in your body? Well, with that, there's a study that was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, but we still need to do more work. Like mechanisms are tough. The first thing they notice is that Okay, there's a huge vasodilation effect. So you end up having what's called endothelial dilation, which is going to decrease the blood pressure. And that just takes the pressure off the heart, the back pressure. So the heart doesn't have to work as hard because there's less pressure that it's pushing against. Now, additionally, there's other things going on. You also have reductions in inflammation and reductions in reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress, which of course put pressure on the entire body, not to mention the cardiovascular system. So when you reduce the inflammation, then you have less risk of arterial plaque turning into these foam cells, which can ultimately cause an issue. And lastly, there's a decrease in arterial stiffness. Now, this is a classic issue with cardiovascular disease where the arteries become stiff because the vascular life, the cells, the endothelial cells actually die and become dysfunctional. And basically the heart is now pumping blood through dysfunctional stiff arteries, which is hard on the whole system, right? So we have that. Now let's talk about some more fun stuff though, growth hormone. Now this unfortunately is where people end up getting absolutely hammered online. And sometimes it's well-deserved because I've seen people do it. People talk about a sauna and they say it's these exponential benefits because there's exponential increases in growth hormone and it's going to make you put on gobs of muscle just by drinking lemonade. And the reality is that that's not how it works, but the literature is pretty darn strong with growth hormone. So let's look at it. There's a study published in Experimental Gerontology, which sounds like kind of a scary thing. It sounds like they're doing experiments on old people. But anyway. What they're doing in this study is they took a look at, not necessarily old people, but they took a look at people that went into a sauna for different bouts of time. So in this case, they did two 20 minute bouts at 80 degrees Celsius with a 30 minute break in between. Okay, so lower temperature for 20 minutes. They found that doing this increased growth hormone pulses 2X. Then they found that going in for 15 minutes slightly shorter bout at a higher temperature, 100 degrees Celsius, with a 30 minute gap in between these two sessions, led to a 5X increase in growth hormone. And this lasted for a few hours after the session. So we now see that higher heat seems to elicit more of a growth hormone response because probably it's changing intracranial pressure, it's probably having an impact on the brain that way. So it's changing how you actually secrete growth hormone. 
Okay, well, what's really interesting is then they said, okay, what happens if you do this twice a day for one hour? Like one hour sessions in the morning and at night for seven days. Kind of unrealistic for most people with time. But there was a 16x increase in growth hormone which ultimately demonstrates that if you're consistent, not necessarily doing two times per day all the time, but consistently hitting a sauna, maybe in the morning, maybe in the evening, book in it, that's gonna have a huge impact on growth hormone. Does that mean you're gonna build a bunch of muscle? No, it probably means realistically that you might prevent some sarcopenia, some muscle breakdown. If your protein intake is high enough, it will probably help support that. But also it just helps stimulate repair and recovery because your immune system also relies a lot on growth hormone as well. So you just gotta pay attention to all this. It's a huge piece, but it doesn't deserve us shouting from the rooftops that you're gonna magically become Jay Cutler. I also put a link down below for the sauna that I use at home. It's a company called Redwood Outdoors. If you're trying to get a classier sauna that looks good in your backyard, that's really good quality wood, that's not gonna be, like I'll tell you realistically, like the big friction that I have with my wife is my wife is like, I don't wanna have a big ugly sauna in our backyard. Like most of them in a barrel, they just don't look that good. But the nice thing about Redwood Outdoors is kind of makes the whole family happy. Like it's beautiful. It looks really nice. It smells amazing. It's classy. And they have a bunch of different varieties, whether it's cubes, whether it's barrels, whatever. So I did put a link down below and that link will get you 250 bucks off if you want to try out a sauna. And people do ask me all the time. I know it's not necessarily in the budget for a lot of people. I totally respect that and totally get that. And I think there's alternatives. Like if you need an infrared or you need to use a sauna blanket to start, like by all means, or take a hot bath, like that can get you a similar effect. But having a sauna is a really nice thing if it's something that you really wanna invest in. And personally, I think it's worth the investment, no matter what company you use. I just think Redwood Outdoors does it really well. So that link is down below. I think you'll really enjoy what you see there on their website with the different variety that they have. The next one is an interesting one, but the data is so strong. And that's on the immune system. There's a study that was published in the European Journal of Epidemiology. It took a look at over 1,900 participants for 25 years, okay? And they looked at respiratory infections, they looked at hospitalizations with respiratory issues, just respiratory illness in general. They found that using a sauna two to three times per week decreased the risk of respiratory illness by 27%. Okay, I'm kind of a believer here, but it found that if you went up to four times per week, the results were even crazier. At four times per week, not even more, just straight up four, 41% decreased risk of respiratory illness or hospitalization from respiratory illness. So potentially decreasing intensity of an illness and even decreasing the ability to contract it in the first place. But how is this working? Once again, we get into mechanisms like we don't entirely know, but we have seen some literature explaining what might be going on. So there was a study published in Medical Microbiology and there's these things called antigen presenting cells. And what they do is they help sort of find the pathogens. And heat shock proteins, which are increased when we are in a sauna, what happens is these heat shock proteins help kind of refine these APCs, okay, these antigen presenting cells. And what they do is they, if you had a laser guided missile, it basically refines your laser to make it X percent more accurate. So you now have a more defined, accurate laser to find a pathogen and neutralize it. But heat shock proteins themselves are a chaperoning protein, which means they help refine a lot of different things and make things more efficient, including the immune system. But they also help sound the alarms. So it's like having a bunch of reconnaissance planes flying around that sound alarms if something is out of place or shouldn't be there. So it lets the body know. Then additionally, heat shock proteins can modulate what are called toll-like receptors. And these toll-like receptors can help with the timing of things. So imagine you have this laser-guided missile that works super well, and you need to shoot it at a target, but you need to wait for the enemy to actually be there. Like what good is shooting and neutralizing a target zone without the actual target enemy there? right? So the timing becomes very important. So these toll-like receptors kind of help facilitate that. So the mediation of these TLRs from the heat shock proteins really could be one of the reasons. And again, we don't know. This is mechanistic theory, but we have the larger scale data to know that something's going on here. But then one of the big reasons that I like to sauna is because of the muscle preservation potential. I say potential because we never know for sure, but the data is strong. 
There was a study published in Frontiers of Physiology had subjects do a 60 minute whole body sauna session or a single leg sauna session, like where they just basically isolated their leg and put it in high heat. And they did muscle biopsy to see like what's changing. They actually took a chunk of the muscle and looked at it. They found that whole body sauna had huge impacts over just the single leg. So it wasn't, it was systemic. It wasn't just isolated in the leg. And what they ended up discovering is that there was an increase in what's called the phosphorylation or activation in human terms of the AKT and mTOR pathway. What this means is that the environment in which muscle protein synthesis occurs and muscle growth, that entire environment was changed and it was tilted more towards a muscle building state. It doesn't mean that you're going to build a bunch of muscle, but it means that you are, in theory, putting yourself in a more opportune state to build muscle when you consume protein and have proper stimulus surrounding this. Could the sauna be the stimulus itself? Probably not. But I do think that using a sauna post-workout can increase the effect of the protein that you get as a result of the stimulus. And another big reason from a performance standpoint, there's a lot of data backing up running, walking, hiking, just aerobic fitness in general. And even though I look like a meathead, I would probably consider myself more of a runner than a lifter, realistically. And when you look at the data here, it's quite strong. There's a study published in the journal Science and Medicine and Sport. Took a look at runners, and it had these runners do three weeks of their normal running routine. Then it had them do three weeks of their running routine alongside 30-minute sauna sessions. What they found is that the sauna group only had a 32% increase in their time to exhaustion. So they were able to go for 32% longer before getting tired, which resulted in a 1.9% increase or improvement, I should say, in their time trial time. So they actually got faster and they went for longer. They had a 7.1% increase in their red blood cell volume. That's like, I don't know, it's not quite the same, but it's like blood doping. I mean, that's crazy. That is a huge improvement in the ability to carry oxygen. So this has huge benefits for maybe, uh, well, exercise obviously, but maybe training at altitude, like, or if you're going to be doing some kind of mountaineering trip and you need to increase RBC count, that's huge. But let's talk about real people for a second too, people that maybe aren't athletes. This study was published in the American Journal of Physiology. It took a look at 47 individuals, okay, and it had them uh, either do exercise or exercise plus sauna they found that the exercise plus sauna group ended up having larger improvements in their overall respiratory fitness, their aerobic capacity and aerobic fitness, but they also had a decrease in blood pressure. So the heart was literally working less hard to support more activity, to support more threshold and support more intensity. So is sauna worth the hype? Yeah, it is. And if people want to rope cold plunging together with sauna, that's doing us a disservice because saunas have literature behind them. Cold plunges just work because they might work. I, they, they don't, there's nothing to really back it up, but you're not a tinfoil hat wearing weirdo if you sit in a sauna. The literature is there. I'll see you tomorrow.